Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the U Media podcast for Friday, April 17th. Uh, this is presented by the Miami Dade Public Library System. So thanks you all for tuning in and joining us today. Uh, we have a really cool guest for you. Um, it's one of my friends um, going way back, um, Andy Ray. Uh, he's from out there in the great state of Texas, uh, and he is a real renaissance man for the uh, 21st century. Um, he is a filmmaker. He's made uh, documentary films as well as music videos, lots and lots of music videos out there. He is a musician. He has a band uh, that's quite popular out there in Austin known as Teenage Cave Girls. So if you have any questions about bands, you can ask him about that. Um, he is a festival organizer. He actually started a film festival out there in Austin, which is really, really cool. He's been around the world showing his films. Um, so if you have any questions about that type of thing, he can ask you, he can answer questions about, you know, film festivals and stuff along those lines. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're really excited to have him. Thank you for being here today, Andy. Right. My pleasure. Cool. Um, so uh, that was a bit of an intro introduction for you. Uh, would you like to uh, maybe introduce yourself and then we'll go around the room um, and everyone else can introduce themselves too. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, Colin and I, Colin and I go way back from our days at uh, Florida State. Um, when, when I was in college, I was into uh, studying literature and, and I had like a film minor. I never did end up uh, getting into their pretty prestigious film school there, but um, Colin and I were in some film clubs, and that's where I got interested in like programming movies for uh, a local, uh, the campus theater we had there. It was a fun place to like show movies, and I was on that club for a bit, and that led to me getting interested in starting a festival in Austin. It was called the Austin Underground Film Festival, and I did that for maybe five years. And uh, then I started like getting serious about trying to make my own movies, kind of working up the courage. And being in Austin, you're always surrounded by music. Live music is a big part of the culture here. So I didn't didn't have much musical training, but I just uh, you just get saturated with the music here and get inspired by so many of your friends, who also you know not a lot of classically trained musicians in this town. It's a lot of like punk rock and uh, and DIY stuff. So it was, you know, a musical side was just a totally unexpected, uh, I wouldn't call it a career path, but it was just like a fun new outlet for me. So yeah, just lots of visual arts and music have been the, the main interest in my life. Cool. And I'm happy to answer any questions that I can for uh, the other people who are thinking of going that route. <laughs> So my staff, you guys want to introduce yourselves, and then we'll get the teams, and we'll go from there. Oh, Galen's in the house. Cool. Hey, Galen. Yeah. What's going on, you guys? Hey, so um, it's Chris Miller, um, and I'm also uh, in the you know music industry, and I'm very interested to hear from you, Annie Ray. I want to know all your experience in Austin, Texas, and around the world with the music industry. So I'm excited that you're here. Happy to be here. Uh, Hi, my, my name is Shubi. Oh, <laughs> you, go. you can go. You can go. All right. Um, so my name is Shamir. I'm one of the instructors in New Media. Um, I am a freelance photographer, but I dabble in other things. I dabble a little in film and um, music. Um, I'm a big music head, so um, I definitely can't wait to hear like your musical, you know, experiences, so. Hi, I'm Viani. I am, my last name, well, I'm getting tongue-tied. I always get tongue-tied. I'm Viani Bo. <laughs> I'm one of the specialists at U Media. I've dabbled in all forms of media. I have a background in journalism and media studies, and I've dabbled in predominantly um, fashion photography and avant-garde filmmaking in college. Um, I'm Rachel. I'm one of the instructors at UMedia. Um, I worked on, I've produced and directed short films as well as created um, different types of multimedia and um, print, um, print art as well. Um, and yeah, 
I'm excited. I really love music. Um, so I'm excited to hear about your experiences. Hey guys, it's Vinny, also one of the specialists here at UMedia. Um, I specialize more into film, but I'm also excited to hear um, what, what Andy has to say about music. Because I grew up, you know, playing drums, you know, so I'm always, you know, involved in music, any shape or form. Um, so, yeah. So we can get one of the, the teens now to introduce themselves. Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, my name is Xavier. Uh, I used to go to UMedia, but due to uncertain circumstances, it um, backfired. Uh, I've done photography a little bit, I've done some Photoshop, and yeah. Honestly, I want to know what it's like to like honestly work behind the camera is what I'm asking. Cool, yeah. We have to talk about that. My favorite yeah. place to be. Okay. Um, I'm Nathan. I'm one of the teams at U Media from the part of the Lemon City Library branch. I'm an aspiring artist. Um, I used to be a production assistant, so I know a little bit about the production, but I want to learn it a little bit more. You know, and I'm just glad to be here. Just gonna grab any information that you have for us today. Okay. For sure. Good to meet you, Nathan. Say that again. Good to meet you, Nathan. Oh, good to meet you too. And last but not least, Galen. Are you here, man? Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, no, I can hear you. Okay, that's Galen down at the bottom. Uh, so maybe I'll start us off with like a, a quick question. Um, so you have a lot of like different interests, like you're, you're a musician, you're a filmmaker, you're a, a vinyl DJ, you're a photographer, um, you know, you organize uh, festivals and these things. How do you like, you know, manage all of these different interests and how do you like, or how are you able to perform them at a level, like at a professional level, um, like all those disparate things? How do you manage that? <clears throat> um, I guess it just, uh, it kind of stems from the, uh, you know, the joy you get from uh, different kinds of outlets for all of your, uh, um, I guess, <laughs> you know, your different interests and emotions have, it's kind of like, I feel like I'm, I'm best in general, I just like filing things where they need to go. So if I get a creative idea, um, the more outlets you have for that idea, the better, more organized your, your like filing system for your arts is gonna be. So sometimes you'll have an idea and you'll think about it and be like, this idea is best expressed photographically. So you can, you can do that if you know anything about photography or this idea will be better as a short story. So you, you know, if you, have some experience writing you can file it in your short story compartment in your brain and then if you get um, kind of burnt out as I often do and working in one medium um, it's good to just jump to another one and your, your inspiration um, can stay at a high level and that's the best thing about having a lot of outlets I didn't try to set out to be like I'm gonna master every discipline in the arts or something because that's like a pretty insanely ambitious thing to do it's just a it's just a great um, way to to have different um, places to put your thoughts. Xavier, okay. you, you had a question maybe about like being behind the camera. Do you have anything specific? Yes. Can I ask um, him? So like, <laughs> I've done a little bit of photography, not much, but I know some things thanks to you guys. But um, I was wondering like, how does it really feel to like actually get paid for taking pictures for someone professionally like how is that lifestyle it feels good i mean i haven't uh i have never been able to live just off of taking photos or anything but it is a really fun it's almost like more of a, a hobby for me and a, something that i want to get better at but it's like a very rewarding process and uh it's, it's, I think when someone hires you to, to take photos, like most of the times when I've gotten paid in the past to take photos, it would be for like a band or something. And I think that's just like a really amazing compliment that another artist 
such as a group of musicians, would put that much trust into someone else with the, the most fragile thing about them. Like someone is willing to let you take a photograph of them, like a portrait. It's really incredible that they would give you that trust because they have to be really vulnerable. The camera sees everything and you can't really hide when you're when you're getting a photo taken, especially a portrait. So I'm just like flattered and honored to have that opportunity for a band or even just a person who wants like a headshot or something. Um, and I see it as a great chance to learn more about photography as an art form and then to get paid on top of that. And, and if you're lucky enough for them to really be excited about what you produce. I don't even charge people until they're happy and I can tell if they're really happy with the result. I think that's the best approach. Like no one, no one wins if like, you get paid, but they're not happy and they still feel obligated to pay you for some job you did. You should always just go the extra mile and like make sure because you're, you're really like, you know, trying to please them. And then if you can inject as much of your personality into that photo as you can and your style, then um, that's like the best of both worlds. Yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good thing to sort of, uh, think on because we've talked uh, like to Franzi for example and other people in the past um, who like work freelance you know and you got to trade on your good name right you're only as good as like your reputation right so if you're not like doing a good job for people and they're not happy with the product that you produce then why are more people going to come to you so that's definitely um, a lesson to learn. And not only that I would even add like you're only as good as your name and a lot of times like you hear like uh like filmmakers say this a lot, like you're only as good as your last movie is a, a, a phrase you hear a lot. And it's pretty true because the sheer volume of images and film and music that people are hit with nowadays, they don't have the, the memory to keep track of like someone's whole career a lot of the time. They don't know like, they see some, someone's photo that you took and it's not very good. They're not gonna be like, oh yeah, but I remember his last photo before that was really good. So I think I'll hire him. They, they totally forgot what you've done until they see it right in front of their face and it's the, probably the most recent thing you've done. So you're only as good as like the most recent work you've done a lot of the times and that gets you the next job. So you're constantly leapfrogging from the last thing you did to the next one. And the, you, you don't even have time, just forget about everything you've done before that. It, it almost doesn't matter unless you're talking about some kind of retrospective on your career, which very few people are fortunate enough to, to get that kind of attention, hmm. to be honest. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully that answered the question. Absolutely. That did. <laughs> and if you have any other follow-ups, feel free to. It's really fun though, I love, I love photography. I've been getting into uh, 3D photography lately, which is super fun uh, and, and not even that difficult. Still, um, it's at least like, they just started putting out, again, uh, 3D analog cameras that shoot on 35 millimeters. So they'll have like three lenses, you take one shot, it gets three shots simultaneously, and then you can animate those three images into a little animated GIF. Or uh, you can even put it on like a holographic printout and you can look at it like almost like a prism type thing. Um, but yeah, those it's just like a lot of, fun. I like like gimmicks and stuff like that. I'm a sucker for like weird offbeat forms of, of photography and like novelty product. I have a, a follow-up question to like what Xavier asked but um, you know for me like when I you know wanted to start off in film or photography and music I always had to go to my friends you know and ask maybe for help or I'll do a project for them for free. Um, so what advice would you say for maybe, you know, maybe you don't have a friend that you can give a, do a headshot for their music video or like their album cover or, you know, whatever project may be, what advice would you give for, you know, whether it's a photographer or a filmmaker or a musician, but they want to start off and, and they want to get, you know, some sort of recognition or just like just starting their work, where should, you know, they go to reach out for, you know, these people. And for sure, we all know that it's gonna be free work at, you know, at the beginning or you just offering your service to kind of get experience. But what maybe, what advice would you give for, 
for those that are just starting and maybe they don't have those friends that they could, you know, practice and, and do that sort of stuff with? Yeah, I mean, for, uh, it's a good question. And, and uh, for something like photography, I think it totally depends on what medium you're, you're trying to work in with photos. Um, when I was learning photography, trying to get serious about it was very recent. And I started with uh, shooting film because I thought that would just be a fun challenge. And digital cameras are, were just not that exciting to me because they're so commonplace. And uh, I thought, I'm going to try and challenge myself and learn how to take some film photos. Um, but I didn't even have the courage to ask my friends to take their pictures at first. I would just do like still life stuff. And once you, you know, get, you don't even need human subjects for video or photo um, and music, a whole different thing. But you can, you can still like practice without human subjects until you get enough confidence that you can ask your friends, just, uh, you know, just work for free. And those examples of your work, if you're, if you're both happy with the product, will get you paid work eventually. But yeah, you're definitely going to have to work for free for probably quite a while. And it's good because, you know, that is the, the paying your dues part of the, of the whole artistic process. Hmm. Any questions for our teens at this point? Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely, Galen. Go for it. Um, okay, so I know a little beatbox, and I really like music a lot but I don't know how to produce any music or like how any music platforms work. So what would you recommend on doing on like how to produce music or what should I do? Cause I want to start making music. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, these days it's, it's totally possible to, to produce yourself if you even, just have a laptop, which I've seen you do since you're here. Um, all you really need is a free um, audio editing program and an audio interface. And I don't know if you, are you familiar with like audio interfaces at all? Have you ever used that term or heard of it? Not much, no. Yeah, that's okay. I only learned about them a, a while ago when I started getting into uh, the, like home recording. Because before that, I was playing in a band for a long time, but I didn't know anything about the recording process. And I chose to trust professionals with that because I knew I was an amateur in that department. I would probably mess it up. I wanted to sound as good as I could. So I would hire people who are really great at their work. And then being around people like that, you learn from them. Just watching professionals work is a good way to pick up um, tips, whether it's a uh, recording or any kind of art. But um, after I saw them working, I got the courage to try it myself. And all you need is an audio interface, which is all that is is a a device that goes between um, your instrument, even if it's your voice. So you have a microphone, you plug that into the audio interface, you plug that into your computer, and the audio interface just lets you capture your uh, your vocals um, with a, a professional standard of quality, and then you can edit it on your computer. So I think it's never, you're never too early or young to start experimenting with home recording. Um, and, and you can get an inter inter interface for like a hundred bucks, maybe even less. Um, and it doesn't have to be any kind of fancy one. That's enough to start learning on. And you can have like a lot of really big bands even um, if they want like kind of a lo-fi sound, so that's like a popular thing to go for, you know, if you, if you don't want it to sound too polished, even big groups will use cheap audio interfaces to try and get that lo-fi sound, like someone like Matt DeMarco or something re recorded a whole album in his bedroom with a cheap interface. So his whole setup was like a couple hundred bucks. And yes, he was going for kind of a lo-fi sound, but those, the technology now is capable of producing professional results with just very inexpensive gear. So get yourself a mic, get an audio interface and a free audio editing program, and you can start experimenting with recording your own uh, music really quickly. I think. Yeah. 
I have a follow-up for that. I, and I think um, one of the things that Galen might have been curious about that is, that you, so once he makes the thing, mm. how do you get the thing out there for people to like listen to? And Andy is interesting because not only is Andy putting things out on digital platforms, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how you do that, but you're also producing physical media. You're producing records, you're producing vinyl. Um, so your, your music, you can actually buy in a store or you can order and have it in your hand. Totally, yeah. Um, I always kind of like, you know, try to go against the, the grain of popular culture because I, I enjoy, uh, you know, doing things in like an underground way or a punk way or do it yourself kind of style. And, you know, it's a really fun thing to do to produce a piece of physical medium in, in this day and age. It's kind of a novelty and people get excited about it. Because it's hard to convince anyone to say to buy music, you know, it's like, you can probably find a way to get it for free. But if someone has a record or something, you might actually pay them for it. And they'll get the digital download widget for free. Everyone throws that in at this point. You know? So like, if your friend's got a record and it's just an, a digital version, you might buy that record from him off of Bandcamp, or you might just listen to it for free. But if he has a record or a tape, you might as well give him like five or ten bucks. And then you'll have both. And then you have a cool little conversation piece you can have on your shelf and your friends see it and they'll get jealous. And you can be like, yeah, this is my friend. Like he made this. And it's a pretty cool thing. So it's it's possible there are people out there who still print press vinyl and uh, make cassette tape and uh and you can make your own tape too. You just get a little four track recorder. So um, <clears throat> getting people to hear it is, is another thing. That's getting into distribution, which is a whole other thing. But um, yeah, it's, I feel like social media and mastering that, which kids now are better than I am because you grow up with it. It's all about self distribution, using social media and getting as creative as you can possibly be with like videos that are self-promotion, um, just like using Instagram, TikTok, whatever it takes to get people's attention in like five seconds, because that's all you have to do. They're scrolling past and you get their attention for two seconds to listen to your song. You've accomplished something pretty big because uh, there's a million other cool things that are on their feed that they're gonna go to and you have to jump at it and grab their attention. So that's that's your challenge, really. You don't need a big company to help you. Though. Like, just focus on getting your own grassroots following, and then companies will notice you if you ever want to get to some big time label, uh, record industry uh, production. But I wouldn't go into music with that kind of a goal. I would just go into it with how can I make my friends um, excited about my music. And that'll just keep building from there. I, I have a question. Oh, okay, I, I promise I won't get too tongue tied this time. <laughs> I, <laughs> I get excited. Uh, I really enjoy that you're multi-talented and that you've dabbled in all forms of media and creative expression. So from anywhere from filmmaking to music to pr even production. Um, I just, this is kind of a twofold question. So the slash generation, I'm not sure if you've heard that term where anyone 35 and under, so a lot of teens or even 20 somethings, if you go to their Instagram bio, you'll see I'm a DJ slash rapper slash, you know, influencer, whatever, what have you. Um, the older generation might look down upon that and say that person is a jack of all trade, master of none. And I think at U Media we, don't necessarily believe in that. We encourage our teens to explore all forms of media and dabble. Um, what would you say to those naysayers who say that you shouldn't focus on so many different things at once? And my second question would be, during your learning process, did you um, learn one form of media and then master that and then move on to the next? Or did you kind of like mix it up and learn um, at the same, learn different things at the same time? Sure. I mean, I think, <clears throat> I think I just started to notice that like 
the more different things that I did. Well, okay, so the main reason I, I got into more than one thing, which I think is always a good thing, and I'll explain why I, I think uh, people might look down upon that, but but they're they're crazy. Because it, it's only going to benefit you to, uh, to learn a lot of different disciplines. But since I was really interested in film when I was younger, that was the first thing that I got into. Um, I was kind of naive and overly ambitious and thinking like, yeah, I'll just like start making movies. And uh, I didn't understand how many disciplines have to come together to make a movie because you have to be good at photography, really. Um, you have to learn composition. You have to learn editing. Um, you have to learn a lot of technical things about gear and camera. At least it helps. So once I realized, oh, I need to probably Ideally, if you're if you're gonna make movies, you should probably like get into like painting and acting and photography and uh, just uh, as many different things as you can that all end up feeding back into the cinema stuff. So yeah, a lot of different and and music because I love um, directors who like you know Robert Rodriguez or John Carpenter. They not only do everything behind the camera and end up editing their own movies a lot of times. They even write the music to their own films. And I think that's super inspiring. And that's something I've been getting into too. So if you can if you can not master a bunch of different fields, but at least be competent in them, it'll help you to to create the most specific version of whatever vision you're trying to convey. Um, if it's in a film or or in an album. Is if you're if you're a great musician but you know nothing about recording process, you're at a huge disadvantage because learning about microphones and tape machines and all that stuff that is technically a lot of boring stuff to us. So a lot of musicians they don't really care about that. Um, those tools let you express yourself in in the most uh, clear way you can. So it's like learning. You know, you're not fluent. You're not a fluent speaker in the language of music if you don't understand microphones and uh, recording gear. So if you want to express yourself in the most uh, specific way you can, that's just kind of something you have to eventually learn. You don't have to do it right off the bat, but I think it's that's why it's silly to still look down at anyone who tries to do a bunch of different things because uh, they all end up feeding back into each other. Thank you for that. That's a great point. Those are great points. Yeah. No problem. Just from my experience, mm -hmm. I do think it is, it is good to focus on some something, but uh, you know, it ends up just you learn from all different um, different experiences, and they end up informing that that one thing. So yeah, just try it all, and then find what you like. For sure. Um. Maybe uh, Nathan, do you have any questions for Andy at this point? Um, actually, everybody that went hit the dot on every question I was going to ask. So I was just absorbing and listening to everything Andy had to say. So I appreciate him, you know, okay. giving us the information. So I, I've yeah. got a I've got a question then. Um, so you you've been in music video. You've been involved in music videos on both sides of the camera basically in front of the camera and, in, and behind the camera. And I know a lot of our teens are interested in music videos in order to promote their work and that type of stuff. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the, like the, the difficulties and, and also the positives maybe of, of both sides of that experience and how that's been for you? Um, you know, as, as a person working with an artist or as an artist working with a, um, a director, that type of thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, I feel like when you're a musician and you want to make a music video for your own band or your own solo project or anything, um, you know, I feel like almost no musicians I run into have any shortage of ideas of how they want their video to be. It's very rare the band would come to me and be like, just do whatever you want to do. Like, we don't care. Here's a blank check and a blank canvas. Just make us look cool. That's happened a few times, and it's the best, best thing you can ever ask for as a, as a music video director or any kind of film director. People just trust you to 
do whatever you want. It's incredible, but you can't really rely on that because bands are full of musicians and musicians are artists and they have extremely opinionated views on, um, on art and especially their image because when you're in a band these days, your image is so important whether you like it or not. You can't really ignore that side of the, the music. Your photos and your videos are going to be what gets people's attention a lot of times, even before they hear you. If you're scrolling through and you see a band that looks really cool in a photo or a video, but the audio is muted, um, you're probably going to click on the audio to hear what they sound like. If they look like a bunch of dorks, you're going to keep going right by and you're never going to even hear them. Even if they sound amazing, they just blew their chance to get your attention because they don't have a good look or whatever. So <clears throat> I think that most bands, if they, they could, they would clone themselves and they would be behind the camera shooting their own video, running sound for themselves and be in front of the camera. That's what they ideally want because that's what I would ideally want as a musician. I have a hard time trusting other people to, to shoot me because only I know what I want this band to be in my mind, but you have to give up some control. And that's the tricky part for a band to do. Just like when they're taking a, a photograph of you or whatever, you have to give over your control to another artist and that's can be a scary thing. So I think I, having been on both sides, it's really been helpful because you can see how to work with people. It all boils down to like, like the experience of shooting a band and being shot as a band boils down to, to human beings and interacting with people and how um, you navigate people's egos because musicians often have really fragile egos, um, any artist, because it's not really like a negative thing. I'm not trying to put artists down. It's just artists make a living putting themselves out there and being really vulnerable and saying, this is my heart. You have to look at it and judge it. So of course they're going to be afraid when you trust that vision to someone else. Like, here's my heart. Try to make it look cool. Could you do that for me? <laughs> it's like the biggest favor you can possibly ask. So if you, if you know how to work with other people, that's the biggest possible thing succeeding in any kind of uh, business side of music or, or the art world. If you can learn how to talk to people and communicate really clearly and effectively about how you want this video to look, because if you can tell them exactly what you want, you're going to get a better chance of them producing a, a video that you like and not what you want. And then you still have to let them inject their own personality because you don't want to just dictate all the terms to someone else because then you're trampling over that artist's own input. So it's all about just working with people and navigating and communicating and letting people express themselves so that you both get something that you want. That's the hardest part of working with other artists. Makes sense. Lots of fragile egos and uh, you have to tiptoe around them. But if you're good at that, you can get great things out of people. Mm -hmm. I have a personal question. <laughs> um, where are you originally from? And are you um, originally from Austin? Uh, no, I grew up in uh, San Antonio. Which oh, is, okay. Yeah, you know, about an hour away. And I was born in Houston. But yeah, I spent most of my life in San Antonio before Austin. And then I've been here for like, I don't know, 12 or so years. Okay, because I know that um, Austin's really popular. They have a huge music music scene, like South by Southwest Festival is there, and a huge tech scene. So, did you move there prior to the new um, creative scene, or have they always had a creative scene? Pretty much, I think the creative scene started in the '60s. Okay. When it really took off, um, and then when I got here, it was already rapidly growing, but I feel like I got here right when the match was lit and the powder keg exploded. The population blew up. It's probably gotten mm -hmm. twice as populated since I've been here. Um, yeah, there's probably like two million people here at this point and I got here maybe like a million. So. Wow. It's been pretty crazy to see that happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, 
I'd like to hear a little bit about you know what's it like to have like a film that's like in a festival in another country like what's that experience like like for you as as a, as a filmmaker and what have you been asked to do at these different film festivals and like you know what paint a, if you can paint us a picture about that totally um i think that was a pretty eye-opening experience um and not what i expected at all but it's weird because the film festival scene is like a a very strange uh strange scene that's constantly changing and uh it's probably totally different now than it was even when i was when i had a feature documentary circulating around which was in 2000 I don't know, 15 or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, I was, it was, festivals were just starting to take online submissions basically when I was sending that out. And now that's like the standard. Like, so I was actually still mailing off DVDs to people, which is kind of crazy. No one even does that anymore, so that's what from, which is great. So you can like apply online with websites like Film Freeway now and you can just have one digital screener send it to every festival that you want and you still i i ended up spending more on festival submission fees than the budget of that whole movie just trying to get it in front of people and that's i think it was a good experience because i learned oh this is what it takes for like the distribution if you're doing it yourself um and festivals used to be a way you could launch your film into possibly getting it in front of a uh, a production company that would buy it um and that that still happens but i was i was making a movie that was like more like an underground film that played like a lot of smaller indie festivals so it didn't necessarily end up like like i feel like i could have done a lot of the i could have saved money and like put that money into things um that would have gotten it seen by more people even without using the festival but it's just kind of another tool to get people to see your movie. But now when you can just put it online, it's maybe not necessarily worth the money. I would suggest to filmmakers who are thinking of using festivals to help them, that they're not like some kind of uh, like magical lifeline into um, getting people to definitely see your movie. Because sometimes my movie would play to like almost no one in a theater. And that's a pretty like hard reality um and festivals would would like not necessarily some of them would do a great job of promoting your movie and in like another city but that's a place where like if i have a, my movie playing in a different country or something i don't know anyone there i'm totally relying on that festival to do their job and promote the heck out of it so that people will show up um kind of like if you're a touring band you can't really do a lot promote yourself if you're going to another city or country that you've never been. You have to have the venue to help you for a tour manager or something. And our festival circuit is a lot like being a touring band. You have to do a lot of the work yourself still. It's not like, oh, I finished my movie. Now I can sit back and just let people tell me what they think because everyone's going to see it if I get it. You have to still like promote yourself and uh, do what you can to make sure but like, it doesn't hurt if you get a festival to play a movie to then promote it more on your own in that city and do whatever you can. Spending money on like on like uh, social media ads to promote it that are targeted to just in Miami if my movie is playing in a festival in Miami. Because the festival in Miami might promote it some for you, but you should probably do some of your own too. So that was like one thing I learned the hard way. I probably blew a lot of money on the wrong things. I should, in the future, I would like to narrow it down into certain festivals that are very powerful mm. and influential and uh, not so much smaller ones that won't do as much as they used to anymore. Because uh, like I said, things are changing really quickly and the internet has made a lot of festivals kind of obsolete. Mm. But sometimes it is really awesome to see your film in a crowded theater. And that's an experience that is rare and worthwhile when you can make it happen. 
Awesome. Rachel, I think you might be muted. I have a question. So um, about that process, like, uh, it seems like a lot of stuff that you've done just because of your, of being a little, not older generation, but not, you know, as the teens generation growing up with social media as the, as such a big um, kind of circus ring for all types of creative outputs. Um, have you ever gone through and back combed into more of the past stuff that you've done and kind of repackaged it or re-edited it and do you think that's worthwhile or do you think that it's that you more adapt and just go full steam ahead and um i guess as a somebody who shoots a lot of analog um as well as like maybe more styles that are more long form like a a film um I guess, what is, is there never really end up seeing? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's a good, good thing to mention because that has happened to me where I look back on old stuff and sometimes it's too, uh, too raw or like too embarrassing for me to like drag up and be like, I'm going to try and resell this because no one saw it at the time, but now there's a chance a lot of people to see it. But, uh, it, it may not be something that uh, I still even connect with artistically or whatever. And I said at different times in your life, so sometimes that can be a, a weird uh, trip down memory lane. But I do, I think, uh, make the most of every project I, I uh, create and complete. And part of that is like thinking of every possible angle you can to like exploit it. And uh, for lack of a better word, do you want? Yeah, any way you can like find it to be relevant again, like you, you can usually take that opportunity. So, like for one example, um, I was listening to old recordings I made that were like demos that I would give my old band so they could learn a song. And I would use a drum machine and a guitar. And I never thought I would ever do anything with these beyond show my band because. You know, I thought it's like really cheesy sounding with just like electronic drums and a guitar. And that was a long, like years of cool and modern now because drum machines are like really popular and in at the moment, you know, like synth music is like coming back in a huge way. And now this is almost like an edgy kind of modern retro thing to have a guitar and a drum machine. And I could like turn this into a an album that might sound cooler now than it did back when it came out because at the time this was just something that was almost like a joke or like something you practice. So yeah, I think it's like good to revisit stuff and you can find ways that sort of surprisingly might even be more relevant today than they were when you made them. Especially when like you never know with the direction pop culture is gonna go and you might find connections to to the past that you didn't even realize could have been there when you were creating. Nice. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from anybody? I have a question. So talking about like your music, your your band, Teenage Girl, was it? Teen, sorry, Teenage K Girl. Girl. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like how does like your distribution work for like what is your strategy for distribution? Like do you I know you mentioned social media but um do you play at any like you know do you try to go to certain venues to try to play or do you have some ways that you know you reach out to certain people to get your music across i know you said that you sell you sell physical copies like what are what is your strategy like to to obviously get you know maybe a new song out or a single whatever it may be yeah i mean um <clears throat> i kind of look at it look at that as uh um Unfortunately, for the better or for the worse these days, music is a product more than it's ever been. You know? So you have to look at releasing a song or a single or a video or a whole album like you're launching a new product line. And I don't mean to sound like cynical or anything. And I think 
that used to be almost like a a bad thing that people would look down on like oh it's too commercial of an approach to music or you're selling out or you know i don't know there's but there's been like a total shift and now it's almost just like accepted as a way that you have to treat music because it's a total commodity so i think like if you're gonna say when i put out a our album for Teenage Kid Girl, we recorded enough material for an album. And then we're like, okay, how are we gonna release it? Um, it would be cool to put out a vinyl record in addition to having it available on Bandcamp, Spotify, all these platforms. Um, what's the best way to do this? And we thought, okay, we'll make a couple of videos for the single. Um, and then you just kind of like, you treat it like your audience is almost like someone you're uh, you're trying to date, and then you think, how am I going to keep them interested in me and my music? I have to kind of like tease them and like build up to something where they they're really like drawn in and they want to see the next thing. So if you whet their appetite with a video, um, they're going to look forward to hearing more of the music, and then. By the time you have physical records, um, they might be willing to pay for that before you even launch the digital. So, you know, you just kind of have to like uh, plan things out in like um, in, a, in a plan of attack that maximizes the impact each, um, each like section of the product um, is rolled out. In. So if there's no right way to do it, and everyone is always coming up with new approaches, but I think that's that's it. Like your brand, your band is your brand. You have to um, you have to like you have to like seduce the customer, <laughs> but in a good playful way. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that it's not always going to be. There's no like you said. There's no formula. There's no way to do it, and you know I. And, and I ask this because, you know, a lot of our teams in our space and even staff, you know, are artists themselves, you know, and, and they have their strategies, you know, of how they do it. Because one way it's obviously that you're going to put it in some sort of platform like Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube and social media. But, you know, then you have your, you know, your own niche strategy for your audience that, you know, that you're saying that you're going to build that plan of attack that's going to get more people to draw in. So whether it's you know a specific video or a certain gig or even like this this type of project that you're trying to do that gets people interested it's it's important to plan for that so, yeah I, we as a band we've, we've experimented with different approaches like paying people to help us reach a larger audience or um, you know you've got to like send out free copies to, to the press which mm -hmm. is just like bloggers or just influencer types anyone who's going to maybe write some nice words about your music you kind of have to budget in that like a good chunk of your records are going to be given away like maybe even half of them at first and then the, the vinyl release for us was almost like a like a calling card like a business card to get people's attention because if you have a physical thing then they're less likely to forget oh yeah like this band sent me sent me music I, it's in my inbox but so are a million other bands but if you have a record in front of you you might actually like listen to it you know what i mean people have uh, so many things coming in all the time you have to uh, stand out in some way and that's that's really like the way to look at everything in general like how can it stand out from the thousands of other bands that are trying to compete for your attention i think that's a good thing um to say because i think a lot of our teens like look to emulate um, you know, the look and the feel of other things that already exist out there. And a lot of times, you know, and that's something that comes with age, right? You sort of see that with age, that you know, it's good to be unique, right? When you're a teenager, you want to fit in or you want to, you know, you know what I'm saying, um, a lot, and maybe my teens can weigh in on that a little bit um, if they're, they're still with us. But yeah, and then later on, you learn that, oh, yeah, it's uniqueness that draws you to the people that you're emulating, right? Like, as, as, a, fil as a filmmaker, I remember seeing some of your films, Andy, um, and there was definitely, like, influence. You mentioned Robert Rodriguez, and I'm sure Quentin Tarantino was an influence, and there's these other people that, yeah, we see these 
these artists and we want to figure out how they did that thing or make our thing look like that. But as you grow older, it's like, okay, what I'm doing uniquely is actually the better part of my work. Yeah, totally. All right. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, now's the time. Otherwise, oh, Xavier, I see you down there, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, as far as music, um, I understand that some people may have writer's block or they can't produce something. And I was just wondering what methods do you have to overcome those obstacles and like, like get your creativity back up? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, I think one of my favorite ways of like drawing inspiration is, um, well, you know, one thing I, I, it kind of ties back into what Colin was saying about trying to do something different or stand out. Like a lot of people think, say, say you're making like hip hop music and then you get stuck in a rut. Like how can I uh, make this exciting or this song it might end up sounding like everything else or sounding like other people and you want it to have an original feel and stand out. I think uh, the most exciting things from music or film or any kind of art is when you take a genre like hip hop and you cross it with another genre. So another, a good way to get your mind thinking in that way for me is like um, to, to get exciting, weird genre combinations. Um, uh, you know, something as silly or as popular as like Old Time Road, where you got like hip hop and like cowboy together. Yeah. It's just some kind of funny, cool combination that works. Even if you don't like the song necessarily, you've got to say like, you know, there's something interesting there because country and Western and hip hop don't always, <laughs> you don't really think of those things going together well. Yeah. And that's like creative. You got to give them that. And I think, uh, for me, it's a fun uh, hobby to like, like I'll throw a movie on and then I'll, I'll mute it and I'll play a soundtrack or a different type of music over it. And it's a really helpful approach because a lot of times, A, music and movies, I always find myself, I don't know about you, but I'm always thinking like, this movie is pretty good, but this music is like ruining the scene or like this music is just terrible. I could have thought of 20 better songs to play over this song, this scene that would have made it way cooler. You know what I mean? yeah. And uh, so half the time you don't even lose anything. Just mute it, maybe throw on the subtitles you can still like follow it. But it's usually a movie I've already seen. I'll throw on like one genre, like a kung fu movie, and then I'll play like hip hop over it or something. And then you start getting these weird uh, synchronicities happening where your your imagination just gets fired up because you'll see something like a weird juxtaposition like a fight scene set to a hip-hop song and then it'll inspire like some strange creative avenue you can explore that maybe no one else has even thought of because you're just causing these weird collisions to happen so that's a fun fun way to like throw on like um like the chinese drama and then have like country music playing into it and you'll get some weird ideas and try to get from <laughs> or just pick to totally unrelated genres and mix them together and that always gets me like inspired okay. it's fun it's fu it's funny that you know these things like old town road come out and surprise us right we're like oh we're, we're surprised by this but it's not a new thing. You think back to the 80s with Aerosmith and Run DMC, you think about in the 90s with Anthrax and Public Enemy, like this is not oh. new, but we keep getting surprised by it over and over again. Yeah. And I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like, why is the joke that like white people rapping, you think like that would have gotten old by now. Or that but white people so can't appreciate like <laughs> hip hop, right? Like it's, like, we've been yeah. doing this since like, the 80s, right? Like I don't get it. Viral, like constantly going viral. And I, th I think that is kind of because it's not like <laughs> the white people of, say, the 80s and the hip hop of the 80s when that joke first happened are not the same white people of today and the hip hop of today. So it still feels fresh to hear like modern people doing modern versions of hip hop. But those genres are so different than when they started. And that's true of every kind of weird combination. So, yeah, 
like why do these things always work? Because the genres are fluid and they're constantly changing. Yeah. Yeah, you're not going to reinvent the wheel, but you can make a new spin on it if you are working with uh, old ideas and like fresh context. Yeah. That is a smart idea, though, to just sort of force yourself to sort of juxtapose things against each other and then see what, what gets birthed out of that juxtaposition. Yeah, I think it's really fun. Even if you don't get any um, new songs or anything, like you might get an idea that'll turn into some other, you know, a story, a movie, like it causes a weird thing. It's kind of like a, it's like a William Burroughs and his cut up technique where he would, I don't know, you know, some of the teens these days may not be familiar with William Burroughs, uh, his reference, but he would take like a page of newsprint and uh, he would cut out random sentences and then he would just stick them together in totally random order. And then he would read this new story back and it would be more meaningful and get at a deeper truth than the original article, even though it didn't make any like explicit sense. Mm -hmm. And that's like the same thing. You can do that cut up with, with video too and with music. And it causes like, his whole reason for doing that was to, to cause uh, just new ideas to be birthed and that, and it totally works. Mm. Thank Xavier, you. You got a, you got something to try out, huh? Yeah, yeah. I, wow. I might try that. That 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 might actually work. Thank you. It's fun. <laughs> Never yeah. thought of that. <laughs> it took me a while to to get into it. I thought I was just being a weirdo, and I'm like, no, this is actually a good, helpful thing. Mm. I have a quick question. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I know. Uh, being in a, uh, doing film has uh, ha helped you travel around the world. I know doing photography and gaining people's trust, it's been something special. And your um, knowledge and experience in music, um, it's been fun. But which one, which one would you say is like the main highlight? Which one did you like the most? Um, yeah, which field? You could only choose one. <laughs> I think uh, it's pretty hard to beat the just adrenaline rush of being on stage and uh, playing live music in front of a, a crowd that's into what you're doing. That's pretty hard to beat. And But I feel like um, I, I really love playing music. Um, but I don't, since I'm not like... Uh, I wasn't raised in any kind of musical tradition or anything. And I just kind of taught myself how to play guitar um, after I even went to college. It was way late in life. And uh, so I just kind of have a uh, kind of crude approach to my instrument. And I can express certain emotions the best that way, like just rage or joy. There's no better platform than a uh, live music. And you get that immediate feedback on your work and immediate gratification and you're living in the moment. And that's like the place to be like, I think even like a lot of religions teach you, like Eastern religions teach you the greatest uh, accomplishment is to live in the moment. And that's the hardest thing you can really do. Uh, so if you, if you find yourself living in the moment and not thinking about anything else, but the thing you're doing that second, being on stage is the greatest. But I do love making films too, not to try and cheat and give you two answers, but they're just so different. You can put so many ideas and take your time and develop this like perfectly crafted bomb that'll go off um, later when someone actually watches it and you have like more control over it. But just immediacy and music are the best medicine. Cool. Nice. Well, I think we're going to uh, pause it here or stop it here uh, for everyone. Um, I'm going to throw out a plug for Andy's uh, full length documentary. I think it's out there on the internet. Is it okay if I plug it, Andy? Actually, yeah, it's free streaming. Yeah, it's, it's called Mondo Fuzz. If you want to see it, it's a little bit different. Um, so, you know, expose yourself to something different. You might get some new ideas, Xavier especially. Um, 
So, and it might be exposing you to different types of music that you've never been exposed to before. So there's a lot of different varieties of bands on there that, um, that Andy's trying to highlight. Um, so it's really, really cool. Um, so check that out. And he does some amazing uh, film work with it and some amazing editing. So it's really cool stuff. So thank you for being here today, man. We had a lot of fun. Yeah, fun. Thanks, guys. Right, guys, you uh, join us again. we'll be here on Monday um, with a game show edition. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun. So later, everybody. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. All right.